Our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Although the 12 days of Christmas are over, we are celebrating today the Epiphany and the story of the Magi from this text. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it has been written by the prophet, And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chest, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In December of 1952, a toxic mix of dense fog and sooty black coal smoke descended on London, England for five days. Deep darkness covered the city. Daytime visibility fell to about one foot. Roads were littered with abandoned cars. Some people said they couldn't see their own feet. Midday concerts were canceled due to total darkness. Archivists at the British Museum found smog lurking in the book stacks. Movie theaters closed because patrons couldn't see the screens. Ordinary life was made nearly impossible, and ultimately this environmental disaster cost 4,000 lives. Despite the fog, however, runners being what runners are, Oxford and Cambridge universities decided to carry on with their annual cross-country competition. How? By positioning marshals along the track who would shout out again and again, this way, this way, Oxford and Cambridge, as runners materialized out of the thick haze. Have you ever felt like you were lost in a fog, unsure of the way forward? Have you ever had to figure out what to do when the next step on your path was unclear? If so, today's story might just be one you need to hear. The story of the Magi, those wise ones from the East, is, as my colleague Amy Miracle likes to say, a short story which creaks under the weight of subsequent embellishment. The text, you might say, is a bit foggy on the specifics, but over time we have added some details, declaring that there were three Magi and even giving them names. But the text really doesn't tell us a whole lot about them. What it does do is make clear what compelled them to journey, and this would have been a long journey, to a foreign land to visit someone else's king. What compelled them was a tiny pinprick of light in the night sky, 
a star. They didn't know where this star would lead them, but they had been studying the stars for years. And when they saw it, they knew deep in their bones that this was a star they were supposed to follow, even if doing so would be like trying to walk through the great smog of 1952. My good friend Jennifer is a Presbyterian minister in California. A few years ago, she shared with me that every year during Advent, as the Christmas story gets told and retold, she tries to figure out which character in the story she identifies with that particular year. The year she told me this, she had just started a new position as an interim associate pastor at a church that felt very different in theology and worship practices than any other church she had served. Her sense of call to that congregation and to some extent to ministry itself was feeling a little foggy. In addition to being a minister, Jen is a trained yoga instructor. When she started that interim pastor position, despite all the uncertainty she felt, she decided to offer a Monday morning yoga chapel service, which combined yoga and Christian worship. She was surprised and delighted that every week the service grew and new people attended. That year, she told me, she felt like the Magi in the Christmas story. She wasn't sure what God was calling her to next, but she was clear about a call to use yoga in her ministry. For that season, yoga became her guiding star. When we feel lost in a fog, the smallest point of light or a faint voice calling this way can offer us just enough guidance to step forward. Now, this passage tells us nothing about the beliefs of the Magi. We know they weren't Jewish. They were from a country where, whose people weren't Jewish. And we know that there was no, thing, no such thing yet as Christianity, as Christ had just been born. But they were searching for signs in the heavens so that when they saw the star, they were ready and willing to respond. And when they finally arrived in Bethlehem at Jesus' bedside, they acknowledge him as king without understanding who he really is or what he will come to do. Even with all these unknowns, they knelt down and worshipped him. How would it look for us in this new year to be a little less concerned with what we believe and more focused on how we sense God guiding us on our spiritual journeys? On this journey, what would it look like to be more concerned with our actions than our beliefs? with what Richard Rohr talks about as orthopraxy, right practice, over orthodoxy, right belief. This requires us to live with openness, with courage, and with movement, even when the way forward isn't so clear. In all of this year's articles and reflections on a new year, I've seen a lot of people writing about choosing their word of the year. Maybe you've seen this too, a word that will guide them, a word like freedom or blessings or joy. The spiritual practice of what is apparently becoming a secular trend is what the church has called star words. It's a practice aligned with epiphany, this day when we celebrate the Magi who traveled such a long way from a foreign land to worship the Christ child and who were guided by a star. We're trying this practice as a church this year to offer each of us some guidance on this Sunday, but also throughout the coming year, we will have after worship for you cards with a word on them. And we're inviting you to take one and to sit with this word as a star for you 
a guide for the coming year. You can pick this up as you leave the sanctuary if you're here in person. If you're online, the Reverend Mary Kay Collins is our online pastor, and we'll let you know in the chat. You can email us. We'll be happy to send you one. But the idea is that, is that this word will be a guide this year, a year that for many of us has already started out with more than its share of hardship and grief. As many of you know, because you were here, we have filled this sanctuary three times this week since worship last Sunday with funerals. It's been a challenging start to the year. A star word is not a word that you are meant to choose, but a word that chooses you, that guides you day by day no matter what unexpected joys or challenges emerge. In this way, you might consider putting your star word somewhere that you'll see it every day so that seeing it and reflecting on it becomes a kind of spiritual practice, a reminder through good times and bad that God is with you and guiding you. For the first eight years of her life, Tina had an idyllic childhood. She grew up in Albany, Georgia, in a large and relatively wealthy family. Her father owned a business and had been able to provide the family with a beautiful home. The house they lived in was her mother's pride and joy, and it was the gathering place for all the families in the neighborhood. Tina loved every nook and cranny of that house. As a successful businessman, Tina's father often took risks. Many times those risks had paid off, but From time to time, they didn't, and the family would have to go without some of the luxuries to which they'd grown accustomed, like shopping at the high-end department store in town or flying in Maine lobsters for a special occasion. Those luxuries weren't so hard to do without, but the year Tina turned eight, the unthinkable happened. One of her father's business endeavors went very wrong, and they lost their house. Tina and her parents and her brothers and sisters moved across town to a tiny rundown house that seemed like a mockery of the home they had so loved. That first night, Tina had to share a room with her sisters for the first time ever. While she lay in bed listening to her sisters crying themselves to sleep, she realized there was a hole in the ceiling above her. If Tina had been a little bit older, she might have been dismayed because a hole in the ceiling big enough to see the stars through would also be big enough to let through some unwanted elements. But as she looked through the hole at a view of the stars, Tina felt comforted, reminded that the world was so much bigger than the house she lived in, bigger than the grief she felt over the changes in her life. The night sky reminded her that although her world had changed dramatically, the universe had stayed just the same. Have you ever noticed that when it's really, really dark, the tiniest little bit of light can light the way I hope the star word provides that little bit of light for each of us this year, whether it's a word of encouragement or challenge or comfort. I hope it is a reminder that in the best and worst of what life brings our way, God is always present, offering guidance, love, and grace. And Jesus, as we sang in the hymn, is our guiding star. In the murkiest darkness, that smallest point of light, that faintest voice through the fog can be enough to help us take the next step forward, to remind us that some things in life never change, and that no matter how far from home we may find ourselves, God is with us on the journey every step of the way. Amen.